Um, I'm going to start the Q&A off with a few questions and then I'm going to hand it over to you guys to ask some questions about the film, so just have a think about that. Um, Michael, it would be good to start with the, the origins. Why did you decide that you wanted to tell this story now? Uh, well, it was Simon Fuller's idea first, at first and we were friends and it, we just talked about the 60s over quite a long period of time and then suddenly out of the blue he said, let's, let's make a movie about it. Because it was not just about people becoming actors or stars or musicians. It, it was a real, as you saw from the film, a real social change. And it really meant a tremendous amount to a, a lot of people. And, and, uh, and it also has an effect right to this day. You know, working class youngsters are free to do anything they want now. And they have somewhere to go apart from an eel and pie shop and a, a fish and chips. Because there's the occasional good restaurant in London now. <laughs> and I, I could just add to that, actually. I think Michael, as always, is being pretty modest about this. Um, uh, so after getting to know you, Michael, and you told me all your stories, and you're obviously one of the world's greatest raconteurs, but your stories have always, always, and that's what's so powerful for me in making this film, has always had a point to them. They're not just funny stories. They're always something that tells you something about a period of time, you're growing up. Um, and I think it spoke to, a, it was certainly spoke to me, I mean, I'm the son of working class parents who had a similar story to yours. I mean, not, not nearly so famous, but <laughs> yeah. um, they were able to break through in a similar sort of way. And I think that's, that's where the story comes from. And, and can I ask you about the process of interviews? Um, I don't imagine anyone said no. Um, did. Did you find that you were having more uh, of your own memories sparked when you were speaking to people over the kind of two-year period? I, I'm sorry. I, I, when you were interviewing the um, uh, participants. Oh, when of the I film. was interviewing, yeah, yeah, and uh, I interviewed all those those people that you saw. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, the the the, the, the real interviews. Uh, can I tell them this? Of course. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> The real, the real interviews we did the film, are not in the movie because we're going to do a TV series and that will be the basis of the series. So I'm, so I'm sorry, Joan. Joan Collins is up there and she's come all this way. And we didn't... It wasn't just your interview, Joan. None of them were in, as you will notice. But you will be on the TV. I would, say, I would just say one of the other slightly scary things from my point of view in making this is uh, yeah, I'm a background, a documentary filmmaker, so normally I'm the one doing the interviews. Mm -hmm. So I had to hand over power, and you know, as you know, directors hate handing over power. Yeah. Um, so it was very scary, but... But to a very scared actor who had no, never no, done no, an no, interview. No, no. I mean, I'd, never, I'd been interviewed millions of times, but I'd never interviewed anybody. But I was about to compliment you, Michael, because I think you are a born... I, I hope actually. so. We'll no, see were. in the TV series. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he should have his own chat show. Yeah. David, I, I wanted to ask about the um, the archive material because it's it's so rich and there's you know there's so much of it. Like, how did you start the research process and did you set certain rules for how you were going to structure it from the beginning? Uh, no. <laughs> I think that was part of our problem. We had no rules. I um, mean, we had a brilliant archive team who. One of them's eyeballing me at the moment. So, <laughs> no, uh, we had a brilliant archive team, and basically, uh, one of the reasons why the film took took a period of time to make is we wanted to find the best stuff. And the two things I wanted to find was a obviously rare stuff that people hadn't seen before. Secondly, anything of Michael. And you know, in both instances, we. I've forgotten. Not done a commercial for Watney's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ring him up for a case of beer. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I mean, one, one of our amazing finds um, and is, is from a, a, a seminal cult filmmaker from the 60s, a chap called Peter Whitehead, um, who made a couple of amazing films in the 60s, one called Tonight Let's uh, we All Make Love in London. But what we, and we used quite a few clips from it in the film, but what we actually found with his rushes, and of course that's gold dust mm -hmm. when you make these sort of films, and Michael was in it as well, so it's sort of, yeah, so it's things like that, really. And obviously the music, it's incredible soundtrack, and um, having 
uh, a lot of the musicians speaking must have kind of opened opened those doors. But um, yeah, again, can you talk about how you first uh, envisaged that would work with the edits? Well, I mean, we I always thought we would we would do it the way we did. I mean, it was just sort of proving that it would work, really. Um, because what the film is, really, I mean, it's 85 minutes. I mean, how can you tell the whole story of the 60s in 85 minutes? And we didn't really set out to do that. What we wanted to do was just give you the experience of the 60s. Um, and what I always had in the back of my mind is um, people tend to listen to music these days um, on iTunes or Spotify. They listen to individual tracks. When I was growing up, we, we bought albums and we listened to the whole album and somebody had got a concept and they were telling you a story in the album. So I thought in the back of my mind, what I want to do with the 60s is tell the story, tell the album, mm -mm. create the album, put the music back in its context. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard those tracks before, but once you put them back in the context, they have a different meaning, hopefully. Mm, absolutely. Um, uh, Michael, you mentioned class before and the film puts forward a very strong sense of the rigidity of, um, of the, the rules and the class system at the beginning of the era and how that was blurred by the mixture of kind of talent and, and, and I guess timing of, of people coming through. Did you feel that um, the end of the era really um, had changed those things or it just made them less uh, clear, the kind of class system? Well, I, I think it changed, in a, changed the whole life of working class people in London. For a start, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, we had eel and pie shops and fish and chips. And then we had a load of extremely boring uh, uh, English restaurants where you had to wear a tie and a suit. None of us had a tie or a suit, so we couldn't go there. So we'd wind up and we couldn't go to the pub because we were, were all under 18. But in, in the 60s, along came Italian restaurants. Now, in, in, in the English restaurant, by 9.30, the waiters are looking at their watches going, well, it's this lot going home, you know? And I went into the restaurant business, and one of the first things I ever did, I said, if I see a waiter looking at his watch, he's fired instantly, he can walk straight out. And, and that, that, that came from there. But what happened was, it was a multiple thing. It was discos came. Regine invented discos in, 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 in France, you know, and they came. And this is where we all met in these Italian... The Arachusa, almost opposite this theatre. Almost opposite this theatre, it was the Arachusa. And this is where we met, you know. And if you went to the Arachusa on a Saturday lunchtime, you would see more movie stars and stars of uh, uh, rock and roll and everything than you would ever see in a, in a, in a restaurant in, in Hollywood. Mm -mm. And, and so it changed changed all the way around for us, every way. And, and we were a group of people who we didn't know. I mean, there was, no, there was no plan to do this. There weren't any leaders or anything. We just did what we thought we wanted to do, you know, and, and, and that's how it went. I mean, I didn't become an actor to become rich and famous because I knew I would never be rich or famous if you saw, you know, the sort of acting and, and accents that I couldn't do. But I can now. <laughs> but, but I mean you, you, I only set out to become the best possible actor that I could become without any reference to anybody else knowing that I was never going to be rich and knowing I was never going to be famous that's all I wanted to do rather than where I first started to work as an actor I was working in a butter factory packing butter that's what I was doing mm -hmm. and I wound up in rep in Horsham in Sussex as a stage manager, we're playing small parts. I started out with one line and gradually doubled them up. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> yes, yeah, a lot of doubling, I think. Right. Yes, 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 millions now. Yeah. Oh, I feel great. What, what, the, the greatest thing for me is to still be here. <laughs> it, it. <laughs> we, we, that's, that's very important, I assure you, when you get to my age. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I'm still working. I've, ju I've just finished a film about the Hatton Garden robbery. There's, there's six old guys who did a robbery in, in the Hatton Garden jewelry uh, place. So I keep working, uh, and I've never thought of retiring. In, in any case, the movie, you, you, you don't retire from the movies. The movies retire you. <laughs> you know, and if you're unlucky, you're 23 years old. 
having just made your first movie. <laughs> there, there was a very practical reason that drugs uh, uh, um, stopped the 60s, in, in as much as, as I was saying before, we all met in these lovely restaurants and discos and all this, and we, we all knew each other and it was all fun. But if you look at people, if, if people are on marijuana, they sit there and they're in a wonderful state. You're not, but they are. And they go, every now and then, they go, wow. Yeah, yeah man. It's faggy. Yeah, yeah. And you're sitting in the disco, bored stiff, listening to this. Or, they, recently, they went on to cocaine. And, and the, when people take cocaine, they start talking very quickly and without a pause and sit there and talk bulls for about an hour. <laughs> Which again sort of cut down uh, the fun of discos and restaurants. And also, w with a lot of people, obviously, if you're going to take drugs, you're frightened to go out because you, you, know, you could get arrested and everything. So the, the social life sort of backed into homes, you know? people's homes and where they had drug parties and everything like that, you know. Uh, uh, and so the centres of it, which was the disco basically and the restaurants, they, they sort of disappeared. But masses of things replaced them in the, in the 70s and 80s. We'll do a 70s. And s well, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the 70s because, I mean, the narrative in the film is that things had started to sour, but you're... You know, your work ethic, you continued to work and, and didn't get kind of too entangled in that stuff. Did you feel at the time that things were, um, yeah, that things were souring? Or is that something, looking back on it, that you've, you've thought? Well, it, it, the thing is, it, everything developed. In, in, uh, um, uh, I remember, I always thought that the greatest thing for me that ever happened to me was the timing, which had nothing to do with me. Because I turned up when writers started to write for working class, working class parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, um, the, the first working class lead ever was written by an out of work actor I know, I know and it was called Look Back in Anger, you know? And, 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 and I was in a play with, I, I understudied Peter, Peter O'Toole, O'Toole, and that was the first play ever about a private soldier in the British Army. I mean, when I, when I was a young man, we all used to go to pictures and watch war films. We all went to see American war films because they were about privates. We, we, could, we couldn't relate to British war films because they were all about officers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so things changed like that. I, and, and everyone seemed to become famous. Uh, I, I, I had a friend called, uh, what was his name? Uh, David uh, uh, Barron, David Barron. And he was like me. We were all out of work. John Osborne in with me. And, and then he said, I'm going to write, write plays now. He said, I'm, I'm fed up with this. He said, he said I'm going to write a play. Mike, you're going to be in the first one. And we're going to, we'll do it at the Royal Court. And I went, yeah, yeah, great, big mouth. And he said, but, but, but I'm, not, I'm not going to write plays as, as David Barron. He said, I'm going to write plays in my real name. So I said, what's your real name, David? He said, Harold Pinter. That's what happened to you in the 60s. Every person you knew became, David Barron became Harold Pinter, and indeed he wrote The Room, which is his first play, and I did it at the Royal Court with his then wife, Vivian Merchant, who then got into Alfie because I insisted she came with me. <laughs> oh yeah, I, 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 think, I think people are, are much freer now, but they don't know it. <laughs> They're completely unaware of the fact well, that I, because I, they, they're always out there saying they're fighting for social justice. We gave it to them. And, and <laughs> it's it still, you, you do not, not get a job because you're working class anymore. If you have the skills, you can do it. But the only thing that changed along the way was, as I said, we all knew that we were never going to be rich and famous. Now, nobody starts anything unless they think they are going to be rich and famous, <laughs> which is what happened to the youngsters along the way. Well, it's a multi-culture here now. Mm -mm. But uh. you've got to remember, London then wasn't. It wasn't a multi-culture. It wasn't anything. I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd just bombed, been bombed out of our wits 
There was nothing there. Nobody wanted to come here. The food stank. The music was non-existent. The, uh, so every, no one came. We were here on our own. And we just made it up ourselves. Well, David, I just, I just wanted to kind of ask you on that in terms of the film. Um, obviously, it'll be ho hopefully be travelling internationally to, to festivals. And it's got, it's got such an energy and an urgency to it. Is it something... Um, you know, that you'd hope would have a kind of inspirational effect on, on younger audiences who aren't aware or so aware of the, the story of that era? Well, of course, you always hope that. But, I mean, I, you know, that's for others to, 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 to decide. I mean, I, I'm a 60s baby, so I grew up... I was born in 1962, so I grew up with this story being spoken or, you know, I heard the music in my house. I wasn't aware of all the, 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 the social change going on. Um, but it, it, you know, it's it's always been an inspiring story for me because, like, I go back to both my parents were working class and they both broke through and you know were able to do things that no member of their family ever did before. So I've always had that in the back of my mind, and I think if there's a small bit of that in the film, that's fantastic. Um, it's always you know it's dangerous to to, to try and um, impose. Uh, too much in, you know, expect people to be too inspired, but, you know, if they are inspired, that's wonderful, because I was. <laughs>